Better Life Media, America's leading source for life improvement, presents Tom Hopkins. Mastering the Art of Selling. Thank you. Thank you. Well, most of you are business people, so let me start off by asking you a business question. I'd love you to yell out whatever comes to your mind. How's business? There you go. That was a test question. I'd love to teach you a great word as I start with you. Because, see, in business, there are days when things don't go the way you'd plan, right or wrong. How many of you had one of those days that everything went wrong? And then one of your friends says, well, how are you doing? And you can't say, I had the worst day of my life. So I'd love to teach you this great word. When anyone asks you how business is, get excited. And I'd love you to say, unbelievable, because that covers it either way, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's start again. How's business? <laughs> how are some of your clients? <laughs> How's your in-laws? <laughs> See, it really covers it either way, doesn't it? Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Whenever I get the chance to present my favorite subject, which is mastering the art of selling, I get real excited. And as was mentioned, I really believe that all of us, in a way, are in sales. We're selling people to do what we like them to do if they work for us. We're doing our best to convince people that we work with to let us be promoted. So we're all, in a way, in selling. I think a great parent is using what I'll teach you today to motivate their children to make decisions. I think a marriage is not an easy thing to keep if you don't learn some selling skills. So I think you'll be able to apply this to anything in your life, okay? So the first thing I want to talk about is mastering the art of selling. Now I have a passion, and Pat, my passion is collecting fine art. And if you look back over the years to the masters of art, the Rembrandts, the Chagalls, the Moreaus, if you study them, you'll realize that they, of course, had a tremendous talent for art, and they used oil on canvas. Well, in the profession of selling or motivating people to make buying decisions, the medium we use is not a canvas and not oil, but what we use are strategies, techniques, questioning skills, and when you paint the picture properly, the positive emotions of the buyer to say yes to your offering are created. And that's, that's the same when I, for example, was early in sales. I didn't understand the basic truth that no one says yes logically. They say yes emotionally, then they defend that decision logically. So if you are in the business of moving people to yes decisions, it is done primarily emotionally. Now, I didn't know this when I was brand new. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you ever had too much month at the end of your money? Can I just see your hands? <laughs> well, if you said yes to that, that's kind of the way I started. I was 19, unheard of to go into the profession of selling, uh, primarily choosing real estate at that point, which was a very uh, high-end item for a 19-year-old. And I didn't do well when I started. Now, granted, today I'm blessed to hold a record for the most number of home sales that have ever been made, but that wasn't true in the beginning. I only made one sale in the first six months. And that's not really true. I did not make the sale. I was the only one in the office. A couple came in, and the, the husband said, we saw a home with your sign on it, and we want to buy it. And luckily, he knew how to fill out my forms. <laughs> People say to me, what happened, Tom, to change you from a 19-year-old kid that didn't know what he was doing? I did what you folks are doing today. I did what you watching this program are doing. I invested in my education. I spent the last $150 I had to go to a seminar 
And the man teaching it, I can honestly say, all these years later, had a life-changing effect on my life. And that can happen to you when you go to a program with your mind open and you listen carefully, intently. You do your very best to take the pearls, those certain things that are said that can change your life if you apply them. And that is the real key. The application of what is being covered in these programs. Taking it, applying it, and having the changes take place. So I decided in putting this program together that I wanted to share with you some things about selling that most people don't talk about. See, because most people think the word selling and they go, well, they got to be great talkers. There's three things I think you have to have first. And I'll ask all of you here, how many of you believe in your product? Let me see your hands. How many of you believe that you yourself would buy it? Oh boy, you better. How many of you are enthusiastic about the profession of selling? Great. Now I want to start off by saying you got to believe in what you do. I've had people on talk shows say, Tom, I'm thinking of going into sales. Where can I make the most money? And I go, that's not how you look at finding a profession called selling. You need to find something you love. In fact, it has to even go more than a love. I think you have to have a passion for what you do. You have to be passionate, where you're so excited to help people get involved in your product, where you just love what you do. Now that, they can't say no to, and never, ever forget this. People will say yes more to your belief, your conviction, than they will your technical skills. So the first key is you gotta buy what you sell if you're gonna have true integrity. I've had people say to me, Tom, I've read your books, I've heard your tapes, I bet you can sell anything. And I say, no, I couldn't. I could not sell something I did not totally believe was good for the consumer after they owned it. And that's the key to professionalism. You have to say, looking across that table, looking across that desk, I know these people are qualified, I know they will be happy, I know they will enjoy this wonderful opportunity I'm offering them. Your belief is absolutely critical. Most people that gravitate into the field of sales are good talkers. Oh, they can talk. Boy, can they talk. But I totally believe if you have to start with three things first. The first thing you have to have before you start telling people what they should buy is you gotta find the product that you so believe in that you're excited about. The second thing you need to do, number two, you need to find qualified people to sell, and then of course, professionally sell those people you find. Those are the two steps. You gotta find them, people that are qualified, then have the skill to professionally lead them to the decision of saying yes. The third thing you need is you have to help people make decisions that are good for them. Now you'll hear that again later on because I want you not to miss the words good for them. That's where your strength comes from. I think you've got to look at a person and say, you're going to thank me in the years ahead because what I'm doing for you is good for you. And that's where your strength comes from. So let's start on some of these questions. First of all, there's a basic truth that we all have to live by in the field of sales. Don't miss this now. If I say it, they tend to doubt it. If they say it, it's true. So the key is to take any statement of fact and see how you can turn it into a question. Now I teach basically 40 questions. I'm going to give you the ones that I feel you can take right today, start applying in all areas of your life. Now the first question is actually titled a tie down. A tie down. Now the tie down is defined as a question at the end of a sentence that demands a yes response. In other words, it's a way of getting yeses, isn't it? 
That was one, wasn't it? I did it again, didn't I? You're catching on, aren't you? They're kind of fun, aren't they? You can make this a speech habit with practice, can't you? Because you do want to get more yeses, don't you? Now, I'd like all of you to now join me. I'm going to say a statement. I'd like you to add the tie down that's applicable and give me a nice nod. Ready? Investing in a quality product makes sense, doesn't it? Gosh, they've got to say yes to that. They won't say, oh, no, we're looking for something that just breaks all the time. <laughs> Haven't you got a real rotten product to talk to me about? No, they'll say yes to that. So that's the tie down. Now, have fun with that. Don't overuse it, though. See, some people go, boy, I love that, isn't it, doesn't it, wasn't it, couldn't it, wouldn't it, shouldn't it, can't you, won't you, don't you, I love that thing. But then they overuse it, and now you're getting pushy. Here's a general rule for you in sales. For every hour presentation, use no more than two tie downs in the presentation. That would be your maximum, or you're moving from giving them a good opportunity to say yes to getting pushy and controlling, and people don't want that today. All right? Our next question technique is one of my very favorites, and it's actually called the alternate of choice. Now, the alternate of choice, the definition is this. It's a question with two answers. Either answer they choose is a minor agreement leading towards the major decision. So you're always trying to give them two questions. Two questions, you say. And, and of course, the, the key to this thing is they must know the answers. This is very important. And the answers must confirm the fact they're going ahead. Now, let me give you the best uses of it. It can be time you meet someone. See, if you say to many people in business, when can we get together? Now, you that are in sales, you're the last person they may want to meet. And they'll stall you. Oh, call me next week. Call me next month. That's why you want to smile and just, just say this nice question to them. Just look at them and use their name. John, I'm available to meet with you today at 3, or would tomorrow at 9 be better? Now they can't say yes or no. Take a 3, take a 9. Either way, I'm going to meet with you. You can use them on location. Would you like to come to my facility, or should I visit you at your home? They can't say yes or no. Take a choice, home or office. They're wonderful. Have fun with these two. I'd love you to just say, I'm going to take these and teach them to my kids. My three children knew all the questions before they were 10 years of age. And they are different today. I can remember my little eight-year-old daughter, Tasha. Now, most eight-year-olds, when they go to the market with dad, they would say, dad, can I have an ice cream? Not Tasha. She'd say, Dad, which would you prefer I have today? A fudge sickle or a popsicle? <laughs> Either way, she gets her ice cream, right? So you can really have fun with this. You can use it with your, your spouse. You know, you, if you want to go out to dinner, you know what you have in the house. You just smile and say, what would you like tonight, hon? Chinese or Italian food? He says, gee, I love... Chinese. Well, you know, we don't have any. Grab your coat. Let's go find some. <laughs> and you moved him to a decision to do what you wanted to do with the alternative choice question. Very, very fun. Now, your third question is called the porcupine. Now, it's a funny name. And I know when I say it, you're going, porcupine? I'll tell you why I named it this. I was taught the strategy many years ago, and it's basically answer the right question with a question and then write that answer on your form agreement paperwork. The challenge I had is I was nervous like most people in our business, and I would forget to do it. I mean, all of a sudden they'd say, how soon can we move into the home? And I'd go, well, there's 30-day possession, there's 60-day possession. So what I learned to do was answer it with a question, how soon can we take possession? John, what time schedule would best suit you? Now when they answer that, 
I've in essence closed the transaction. And I called it the porcupine because I started saying I won't forget it if I visualize they threw a live porcupine in my lap. Now what would you do if I did? I threw a live porcupine right at what would you do with it? You'd throw it back. That's what we do with the right questions. Let me throw some at you. Ready? Do you have one in blue? Would you like one in blue? Isn't that simple? Do you have a smaller size? Would you like a smaller size? And when they say yes, they bought. So simple. Gosh, I used to love it. I'd be showing a home. I knew they'd love it. And all of a sudden, the, the wife would go, now, Tom, will they leave that swing set in the back? I didn't say yes or no. I said, do you think the kids would enjoy it? Well, when she said yes, she just bought a swing set, what stays with it? The house. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so it's a real fun technique. And again, you in sales, you, I see so many lost sales because people ask a question they would only ask because they want the product, and the people don't answer it with a question. They've lost that sale. So get sensitive to the porcupine, all right? Now, people ask me, Tom, why don't people purchase my product when they should? Well, there's 10 reasons that you should know, because there are 10 basic fears that the average human being has to invest money for benefits of a product. Now, you, you want to know these fears because you really want to work on them so that your presentation makes sure that you eliminate these 10 fears. Now, the very first fear I'm addressing to you that are in sales, and everybody knows it. They know what you do for a living. The first fear is they are afraid of you. Why? They're afraid to be sold. See, we are great consumers. We love to own things, but people today are afraid of being sold. So the key is to not come across like a salesperson, but try to come across more like an expert advisor. You see, when you come across like an expert advisor, they stop looking at you as someone trying to sell them. And that's, of course, when everything works. The feelings are right. They don't know exactly what they should do, but they, they, they feel good about you. See, if you were to boil down the whole key to this business to one sentence, let's just say hypothetically, you, you, you were in the elevator at the hotel, and, and I was in the elevator, and you says, Tom. I'm studying your training, I've read your books, blah, 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 blah. We got 10 floors till we get to the top. What is the real secret? And I would say I can boil everything I teach down to one basic truth. If you make something happen with people, you're going to do well in this business. What is it? You have the ability to have them like you, trust you, and want to listen to you. You see, if people like you, then they trust you, and they want to listen to you, not have to. They now open up and say, I need more information. That is when you really are going to do well in this business. Now, the second fear that people have, they're afraid of making a mistake. And you know, all of us are. Many people have purchased something they wish they'd never purchased. They were told something and it didn't work. The warranty wasn't good. And so they have this fear that, hey, I'm not making a mistake. That's why in any presentation, you must watch as we watch the presentation to make sure that any of those fears about making a mistake are covered in the presentation. Now, your third fear, they're afraid, afraid of being lied to. See, many times they've been told a lie in the past. Anyone over 30 years of age has purchased something where it didn't do what they said it was going to do and they felt they were lied to. That is why it's so important that you are extremely honest and truthful. See, I believe that you can have a great presentation, you can tell anybody anything based on what you're saying if you come from a foundation of truth. And that's really, really important to have a long-term integrity and ethics with your, with your clients. Now, the fourth reason people are afraid to buy is they're afraid of incurring debt. All of us are. So many people have too much debt today, and they look at your product. They may have to increase the monthly investment. 
And right away they're going, I don't think I can afford it. I, I'm afraid of that. So again, it's so imperative that in your presentation that you make sure they realize the value that they get. Because see, that's what the exchange is in selling anything. It starts with perceived value as to the benefits they're going to get. Then it goes from perceived value to real feelings of value. And that's why one of the great keys to selling anything is learning how to pour on value. Because if there's enough value, it diminishes the investment they're going to make. Fifth reason, this one takes a little explaining. How many of you that are in sales market your product primarily to two people, a husband and wife at the same time? Let me see your hands. Okay, quite a few of you. You've gotta be careful here because this next reason has to do with one of the, the couple at the table. Meaning, let's say that you're a real good friend of the husband and he's made some mistakes. You're close enough to tell him, let's say you're in financial services and looking at what they've done with their investment portfolio, they've made tremendous mistakes. Well, now here's the situation. All of a sudden, you are real blunt with John. John, what were you thinking? This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, John feels his ego is threatened and the next fear takes place. And that's the fear of losing face. To where he loses face, in front of his wife because you talk down to him. That's why it's very important. Here's another concept. Make everybody at the table feel important. Never talk down to anybody. Never belittle anyone. It's amazing if you make everybody feel important, which is, again is uplifting them, how they'll want to do business with, with you not only once, but for a lifetime. And that's when you really have done your job, when they want to be a lifetime client. My last year in sales, 96% of the people I met and got involved in our opportunities were referred to me by other happy people. And that only happens when you do a great job for them. When they know, wow, this person cares more about me than making a sale. And that's something you want to work on, that feeling. Now there's a word for that. You've heard it during the program, and it's called the word empathy. See, empathy to me is the most important thing people have to feel you have for them. You have empathy for them. Empathy is putting yourself in their shoes. In fact, I have a, a poem. I love poetry. It's another thing I, I write. I love it. I have a poem that I think will really illustrate to you what this empathy thing is all about. Let me, let me share it with you. When you walk down the road of life and come to that bridge, no, knowing, knowing. How many of you right now are just a little worried about me <laughs> forgetting my poem? Anybody? How many of you had this feeling like, Whoa, come on, Tom. Don't forget the poem. See, if you had that feeling, that's empathy. Where you put yourself up here with me, with all that's going on here, and me forgetting the poem. You that felt that, I salute you. You've got empathy. For the others of you that said, oh, finally he blew it. That's great. I'm worried about you. <laughs> Let's look at our next fear. They're afraid to say yes to your offering because they're afraid of the unknown. They've never heard of the product. They don't know what it's all about. This is why for, I would say, 90% of you that are in sales, your whole process must be an education process where you are educating them as to the benefits they'll derive from owning your product. Yes, you are doing a sales presentation, but that's one reason why, and I'll, I'll share this with you, oftentimes we test students after they graduate from our training, and we follow them in their careers. 
And the people that seem to do the best in sales come from either the nursing background or flight attendants. Now, I know that sounds hard to believe, but we've followed these people, and the reason is, I feel, is a nurse is a teacher. A flight attendant has to put up with some people that sometimes are very nasty. They'd have to learn how to handle the people in pain. And that's really what you do in the sales process. You're having people who might feel a pain that you can solve with your product or service, and you've got to educate them and lead them in to feelings of ownership. Your next fear is the fear is because of a bad past experience. See, they had a bad past experience. They said yes to something, and gosh, I wish they had never seen it. And right away, you sound like that last person. And they go, we had that happen once before. Now, you'll also find another truth. You that work with people over 50, as they look into their golden years, they are reluctant to take risks like they did when they were younger. So you really have to make them secure with your presentation to where they feel, boy, this is really going to be good for me. And that's why, again, they'll have bad past experience memories if you don't handle them properly in your presentation. Now, number eight is important. Their fears can be based on prejudice, meaning someone prejudiced them. Uh, I had this happen in my, my career. It was the only time it ever happened once in all the years I was in business and sales. I had a couple who was definitely qualified, but after two years of working with them, I could never close a transaction. And the reason was they had been prejudiced. Now, prejudiced by number nine. Their fears were based on a third party. Their parents said they shouldn't do it. Their grandparents said they shouldn't do it. And so they'd been prejudiced by a third party, and because of that, that fear of making the mistake, the fear of all the things we've talked about, overwhelmed them, and they could not go ahead. Now, your last fear is an interesting fear. It's uh, a fear because of the words you say. Now, when I first started with you, I, I mentioned comparing selling to an art form, and the great masters using oil and canvas, and we use words with people. And every word you say has one of two effects on people. Either it's a positive effect or it's a negative effect. And I'm going to really ask all of you that are participating to not use these eight words because I totally believe a person can be this close to saying yes or this close to saying no. And all of a sudden they hear one of these words and the fear overwhelms them. Now the first word you don't want to ever say to them when you're telling them how much the product or service is, is the words cost or price. See, because as soon as you say the cost is, the price is, their first reaction is it's too much or we should shop around for a lower price. Now that's what cost or price triggers. John, the price of this vehicle is 28,500. Right away they go, that's a little higher than I thought. Maybe we should go up the street to another dealership. Or many people today are overwhelmed by the appreciation of what things have gone up to. And so you give them a price and it knocks them out. So I'm really going to ask you when you tell people how much your product or service is, don't use cost or price. Share with them the total investment or the total amount. Now, the next word is a real fear producer. And I know many of you may, when you're asking them to invest, say, well, now let me just go over the down payment. Now, as soon as they hear down payment, the first thing they think is, gosh, I didn't want to come up with the money right now. Because, see, down payment means write the check. And they go, we're not doing that. We're only looking today. We're shopping. We're not buying today. So I'd love you, instead of down payment, to say the initial investment or the initial amount. Those do not create the fear that down payment creates. Now, your third word you don't want to say, because everybody in the country has too many of these, and that's the words monthly payment. 
See, when you say monthly payment, it takes them back to that little table that they sit at once a month, and they write a check, and they hope they have enough money to pay all the bills. So I'd love you to not tell them the monthly payment. Instead, use the monthly investment or the monthly amount. Monthly investment or monthly amount. And of course, your next word. Boy, you talk about a scary word. Don't call it a contract. See, when you say, let's go over the contract, they remember mom and dad saying, don't you get near a contract. In fact, if you get near a contract, you better read the small print, and if you don't understand it, make sure you get an attorney involved. So all of that is built in when you say, let's go over the contract. So instead of calling any printed form that you fill out and they put their signature on, don't call it a contract. Call it either the paperwork or the agreement or the form. See, it's a whole different feeling. The next word you don't want to say is a small word, but it's very fearful. Don't say the word buy. See, when you say when you buy this, that's what they didn't want to do. They're there to look. So every time you go buy, when you buy, you're going to love buying here, buying there, buy this. They go, we're not doing that today. And many of them you're going to meet have made a pact before they meet you. Where that husband said to that wife, Mary, you keep your mouth shut. We're not buying anything. <laughs> we own too many things. You can't say no. I'm not sure what this whole thing's about. So right away, every moment you say buy, they put up the defenses. So drop by. And from the moment you meet them, use the word own. See, it's amazing. People love to own things. They're just afraid to buy them. And again, it's a whole different feeling. It's amazing. Instead of saying, you know, when you buy in this neighborhood versus when you own the pride of ownership that people do that live here. And it's a whole different feeling. And we are, again, helping people emotionally say yes. Then the next two words, they're the same in essence, but the next two words are very scary words. They are sell or sold. See, when you say to someone, when I sell you this, right away they go, you're not doing that. We decided we're not buying and you're not selling us. Or some people go, you know we sold your friends? And they go, yeah, you pushed them into it. You're not doing that to me. So try to drop from your entire vocabulary the words sell or sold. You use the terms get them involved. Get them involved or help them acquire. We've helped so many companies acquire this business machine. We get so many families involved in this area. It's amazing. They'll let you get them involved. They'll let you help them acquire it. They just don't want you to sell them. And again, it's a whole different feeling, all right? The, the next words, a word I really dislike, and when I hear it, I want to grab the person and say, you know, if I were your client and you said that word to me, I would be on my way out because I don't want to get involved in one of those. And the next word you don't want to say is the word deal. See, so many people have gotten into a bad deal that they were told was a good deal. So you, of course, say, this is a good deal, and they go back to the past and go, we had one of those. No, thank you very much. We're not getting involved in another deal. Especially people over 50. They hear the word deal, and they go back 10 years ago when they lost all they had in savings because someone said it was a good deal, and it wasn't. So instead of the word deal, whenever you're talking about how great this opportunity is, you use that word. Either opportunity or transaction. John, I think you're going to agree this is an excellent opportunity for you. I think it's a transaction you're really going to be happy about. Now, in business-to-business -business sales, this is wonderful. Because oftentimes your decision maker is not the president or the CEO of a company, and when they hear the word deal, they get skeptical. But when you say to them, this will be a transaction that all of your company will be thrilled with, it doesn't create that fear of a bad deal. 
Now you're doing everything right, and you're moving right along. You've filled out your paperwork. You've done everything, and it's now time for you to go for the signature. And you ask them to sign it. Don't ask people to sign anything. What if mom and dad said, don't you sign anything? And that one word sign where they were heading towards a yes can push them into no. So instead of sign, we ask them to okay it. John, I'll just need your okay here. Or you can ask them to approve it. John, I'll just need you to approve it. Or you can ask them to authorize it. Just need you to authorize my paperwork as you would a check. <laughs> or you, you ask them to endorse it. It's amazing. They'll okay it. They'll approve it. They'll authorize it. They'll endorse it. But they won't sign it. And I, I mean it. I've watched it. I, I had one company do tests on this. They, had, they decided after they invested in some more training, they said, hey, let's test this. And it was amazing how many people, when they were asked to sign it, said, we're going to think it over. We'll get back to you. Amazing. And I really want you to work on this. I mean, practice it. John, I'll just need you to okay my paperwork right here, and we'll set up delivery next week. Some of them won't know what you mean. They won't know what you mean. Watch. I'm going to have you be the buyer. All of you are the buyer now. Ready? And I want you to say, when I ask you, to, to go ahead, I want you to say, oh, you mean sign it. Ready? So, John, Mary, I'll just need your approval right here, and we'll set up delivery for next week. Oh, you mean sign it. When they say, oh, you mean sign it, all I want you to do is give them a nice smile, nod your head, and say one word, fine. <laughs> and now they know what their job is. Try it, gang. It works. John, Mary, I'll just need your authorization right here. Oh, you mean you want us to sign it? Fine. And nod with a smile, and they know what they're supposed to do, and they will take that pen and put their approval on it if you'll do it just like that. Now let me go into what I consider the, the thing that makes our organization different than most, because we really work on one subject. And it is the biggest art form of the art form of selling. And it's called the art of closing a sale. And it is the one area that people have the most challenge with. They can prospect. They can make calls. They can usually do a decent presentation. But where they fall down is moving from giving information, sharing all the presentation, and then moving in to the final closing of a sale. And this is an art form. Now, I will say this to you. If I were to walk on this stage, five of the highest paid people in the United States in sales, had them sit at a table or desk and do their presentations, you would see differences in the way they came across. But the same would be true of all of them. They would all end up getting the check because they have developed what they call their own closing style. And that's what you need to develop. Now, you can copy someone else and then take that and make it yours. Now let me give you the definition of closing, because many people don't know it. It's professionally using a person's desire to own the benefits of your product, then blending your sincere desire to serve in helping a person make a decision that's truly good for them. See that? I, I made that in bold print, good for them. That's when you do the job right. Now, what really happens when you close a sale? Do you know you, you are really doing four things? Number one, you help clients rationalize the decision they want to make. That's what you're doing. You're helping them rationalize it. The second thing you're doing, number two, is you help clients head off procrastination. See, they are procrastinators, but with your great presentation, you head that off. Number three, you help clients deal with their fear. Based on what I've taught you so far today, we don't produce fear with the words we say. Number four, you help clients overcome indecision. Overcome indecision. Now, those are the four things you do when you're great at that table, presenting and closing a sale. The final closing, this is the final closing, begins one of three ways. 
The first way it begins, now I'm talking, they know everything they need to say yes, and now I'm going to the final closing. The first way it starts is the buyer asks you a porcupine question. The answer to which you then write on the paperwork by saying, let me make a note of that. In other words, they go, Tom, will you train us to use the copier? You don't say yes. You smile and say, is training something you'd like? When he says yes, you then move right onto the form. Well, let me make a note of that. Training required, and I am closing the transaction. That's such a beautiful way to start. The second way it starts, number two, you ask them the what we call a final closing question, and it's a minor close. It's called the test close. So you ask them a test closing question. Gosh, I'd love you that are in sales to just turn to the buyer and just say this sentence. John, how are you feeling about all this so far? I didn't ask him to buy. I said, how do you feel? And when they say they feel good, that's when you know it's time to move right on to your paperwork by just saying, let me make a note of that. The next way it begins, see, there's three ways. The third way it begins is you just ask them a reflex question and move on to your paperwork. Now there are more than this, but the most popular reflex questions. Number one is the date. Gang, you're, you're, you're well off if you don't know the date. Just smile and say, you know, John, I've been running at such a pace, do you know the date? He gives it to you, just thank him and put it on your form. And you're closing. Number two, the correct spelling of the name. Don't do this with a Jones or Smith, but if it's Mr. Stinskowski, smile and say, Mr. Stinskowski, can you help me with that spelling? Well, I sure can. He spells it, you fill it out on the form. The third way, which was my favorite, was you ask the middle initial. Mary, did you have a middle initial? She says B. You say, let me make a note of that, and you on the paperwork. And you're going to have such fun when you make this happen. Now, here's another very, very critical point. When you finish filling out any form, you pick it up, you scan it for correctness, and deliver your final closing sentence. And you want to write your own. Let me give you an example. Here's what we call just a generic one. John, with your approval right here, will set up delivery for next week. And there you've asked him to put his signature on it. Now here is the most critical instruction I'll ever give you, and I learned this many years ago. Whenever you ask the final closing question, and you that are taking notes, you can score this big. When you ask that final closing question, you must shut up. See, if you talk, you'll end up owning it. Let them have it. Now, this takes a little work, because it's, it's nerve-wracking. But when you smile and say, John, I'll need your approval right here, and you shut up, all he can do is either give you the reason he's not going ahead or put his approval on the paperwork. I'd like to have you join a very elite group, and those are the people who know how to handle the words, I want to think it over. Now, all of you in sales are going to hear, I want to think it over. And I'd love you to learn what to say, because this is the most important thing you're going to do in all your career, is when they say they want to think it over. You want to smile and be real nice and just learn these words. You say, oh, that's fine, Mary. Obviously, you wouldn't take your time thinking this thing over unless you were seriously interested, would you? I mean, I'm sure you're not telling me that to get rid of me, so may I assume that you'll give it very careful consideration. She will agree. Then you simply say, just to clarify my thinking, what phase of this opportunity is it you'd like to think over? Is it the quality of the service I'll render? Is it the color? Is it something I've forgotten to cover? She says no to all of that, and then you simply say, seriously level with me, could it be the money? Because nine out of 10 times, it is the money. She will say the next thing. Tom, I think it just costs too much. Please, when anyone says it costs too much, just smile and say, you know, today most things do. Can you tell me about how much too much you feel it is? Now you get an amount of money. Then you move to the next strategy, which is called the reduction to the ridiculous, where you take an amount of money, find out how many years they're going to enjoy the product, get it to an annual amount, then go to a monthly, then to a weekly, then to a daily. See, a home that's only 25 cents a day too much is easy to accept 
rather than a home that's $3,000 more than they want to pay. And that reduction of the ridiculous is a fabulous technique. All right? The last thing I want to share with you is this. You got to learn to psych up every day in business. No athlete walks on the court of the field without getting some adrenaline pumping. So I'm going to ask you to learn how to psych up, and I'd love you to start tomorrow morning by saying this with enthusiasm three times in the morning. Today, I will win. Why? I'll tell you why. Because I got faith, courage, and enthusiasm. Let me hear you do that. Today, I will win. Why? I'll tell you why. Because I have faith, courage, and enthusiasm. You do that three times, that adrenaline gets pumping. Now tell your spouse what you're doing. <laughs> You'll get out of that shower excited for the day. And you got to be excited today. I've so enjoyed presenting this and so hope you'll take the ideas, apply them tomorrow. Have a greater income. Be the person of your dreams. Thank you so much. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's very nice. We hope you've enjoyed this special presentation of Tom Hopkins' Mastering the Art of Selling. If you'd like to own a copy of this program or any of Better Life Media's programs, please visit our website at betterlifemedia.com where you'll find all types of valuable life improvement information.